So the passage that was read a little earlier during our scripture reading is where we want to spend a few minutes today. And uh, we just uh, encourage you to join me in prayer, asking that God would be our teacher now in these moments. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if it is not for you giving us understanding of your word, um, we are lost. We are helpless. It is your Holy Spirit that we rely upon to illuminate our hearts in these moments. Thank you for the truth of your word. It remains true whether we uh, live it or, uh, or read it or understand it or obey it. It remains true. Thank you for that truth. May we then enter in uh, to hear it, understand it, live it, apply it. May it very much be a part of our lives. And, uh, thank you that we have the written word in front of us that we uh, truly can ponder and meditate upon. We pray that your living word would connect with our hearts in a very real way whatever it is that uh, we may be thinking about, going through, facing, uh, dealing with uh, various things in life. Lord, I, I pray that there, the truth of your word uh, would connect with our heart and that we would uh, know that we have met with you in these moments this morning. May it be less of self and more of you. In Jesus' name. As we have been looking at this first chapter of Acts, we have just been reminded that following Jesus' earthly ministry, he ascended to heaven, and then he told them to wait, or no, I'm, I'm, not mix, I'm mixed up with my order. Um, he didn't ascend and then tell them. He told them before he ascended to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Father, which would come, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And so that was their job in that moment, was to go back and wait. Uh, they had a job that they were to do. Now, they didn't have long-term plans yet, although God had given them that, in that the gospel would be spread to the ends of the earth. But they didn't quite have it laid out as far as next steps at this particular moment. And so we, we see them in this in-between moment, where they are then preparing for what is next. Have you ever had to prepare for what is next? Well, I think you have in various ways. If you are in school and they tell you that there is a test the next day, then because you are a good student, and all of you are really good students, you will study and you will prepare for that test the next day. If you are going to a job and the job requires a certain skill set or a certain uh, uh, piece of equipment, then you will prepare for that by uh, getting what you need together. And I've seen how some of you construction guys do this. You, you come home uh, from the previous job and before you shut her down for the day, you want to get everything ready for the next day's job. And so you, you get the truck loaded you get everything lined up, and you're ready to go. There's a certain amount of preparation that goes into things. Um, we have a number of ethnos students or staff here, and, uh, and uh, those that are preparing to serve in a particular location, there are certain things that you need as you prepare for that. And so it, training is a part of that. And many of you could attest to uh, knowing what it is also to work within the local church. And uh, there are things that we need to do to prepare. Some of you Sunday school teachers this morning had to prepare your lesson. And you had to uh, think that through and study that through and be ready for that. Well, in the same way, these early apostles then had to prepare for what was coming next for them. And God was uh, using them in a very unique way and preparing them for that. I want to challenge you this morning that there are things that God wants you to be involved in. And I want to challenge you to be preparing yourself for those things. You may be saying, well, 
I'm not going to volunteer for anything, and therefore I won't have to prepare. Well, in the Christian life, uh, you, the moment you signed up for salvation through Christ alone, you also then signed up for a life of serving him. And not to earn your salvation, but because we have it, we are blessed to be able to serve. And so we're going to look this morning at just a few of the things that these early apostles, these individuals, that they had to uh, do or be a part of as a part of preparing for their ministry. So it's already been read for us, but let's pick it up at verse 12. Then they entered to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. It's interesting, as I did a little research on uh, what is a Sabbath day's journey away, uh, here's, here's what I uh, found in, in some research. They, there was a certain amount of, of space that that uh, was, that you were allowed to walk this far, and uh, I don't actually remember the exact amount, but... What it was, was when the, they were set up in the wilderness, in the, uh, the Israelites in the wilderness, uh, all of their tents where the people would live, the tabernacle was kind of in one central location. The Sabbath day's journey was how far it would be from the furthest tent to the tabernacle. Isn't that cool? And that's what they were allowed to journey on, on that particular day. So it tells us that this Sabbath day's journey uh, brought them to Jerusalem. And when they had entered, verse 13, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and, J and John and James, and notice it lists all of the 11 that are there. Now, it lists 11, which is a reminder for us. And we will get to that in a moment. We always think of the 12 disciples, do we not? There are only 11 that are listed here. And so that is a significant thing, which we will get to in a moment. But as they are gathered together in this one place, verse 14 tells us, all these with one accord, and it's not talking about the Honda, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And so there being about 120 people gathered here, and they have uh, come together in this particular location, which uh, the implication of this upper room was that it is probably the same upper room that Jesus uh, had that last supper in with the disciples. I'm not entirely sure about that, but that seems to be what the commentators are suggesting here. And as they're gathered there, there's something that they are doing that will prepare them for the work. And you and I should do that same thing because it will prepare us for the work that God has for us. Who can tell me, give me a voice here, what it is that they are doing? Waiting, yes, praying is what, is what I was specifically looking for there. It is a period of waiting, but while they were waiting, they were in prayer. And, and I like how it's worded there. Uh, it mentions this with one accord, which speaks of one mind, one purpose. There was a unity uh, amongst them as they gathered together. There was uh, this real common bond, and of course the common bond was Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus, that, that was what tied them all together. So with one mind, one accord, and then the second part of that is devoting themselves to prayer. So it's it's, it's persevering in it. It's being steadfast in it. It's attending constantly to it. So there is a difference here in, in how we might think of prayer. You know, uh, sometimes what we do is we start things off with prayer. Uh, one author says it's kind of like a starter pistol. 
you use prayer just to kind of get things going. And uh, sometimes that happens before a meal, right? You get everybody organized and and uh, let's let's say a little prayer, and and then we carry on with our lives or whatever. That that we have to be careful as believers that prayer doesn't become that for us. Here, the idea is that this is what they were giving themselves to. It it doesn't mean that they never took breaks. It doesn't mean that they never left to use the washroom. It, it doesn't mean those sorts of things, but it means that the purpose of their gathering, the reason that they were there, yes, they had been told to go there by Jesus, but they were being very productive in that environment as they were devoting themselves to prayer. I want to challenge you in this matter. I want to encourage you as you prepare for the work that God has given you to do to be committed to prayer. And we know that that can be a hard thing. We know it can be a hard thing. And yet what God so often does is, is he drives us to our needs. He, he, in a sense, allows us to become frustrated with some of the circumstances of life. Or, or we just can't understand them. We can't figure them out. And, and what that actually is doing is driving us to a place of prayer where we will say, Lord, we must depend upon you. Because we can't figure it out on our own. May you be an individual who continues to wrestle and struggle in prayer. I've shared with some of you at, at prayer meetings before where um, I have some diaries of some of the, the great preachers of days gone by. And, and uh, one particular one stands out at the founder of the People's Church, Paul Smith, talked in the early days of the ministry there, before things really got going, about prayer meetings. And I have in some of his notes uh, that were published in a little book uh, where they would have these seasons of prayer and he would say something like, oh, it just felt so dry tonight that Nothing really moved, you know. No, no hearts were responding. It was dry. Some of us have maybe been in a dry prayer meeting. Sometimes we tend to think, well, it's this reason or that reason. It could even be our own heart that is the reason. And he spoke in this particular book of persevering through that time and and all of a sudden then, at God's time and in God's way, things broke out. And many revivals began to happen in the hearts of God's people as they persevered in prayer. Some of the old individuals used to talk about praying through. Sometimes we pray for things. Their language was a season of prayer that they prayed through. So we have these apostles and others who are gathered here. And it is there is a sweetness in the room as they pray. And I think a fervency would be there. There would be a lot of things on their heart and on their mind. But then continuing on at verse 15... In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled. Now, this is another interesting thing, just pausing here, that as he stands up, he, he immediately goes to the greatest resource that we have here uh, in our hands, which is scripture. He speaks of scripture. He says, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled 
which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So now Peter begins to talk about Judas, but he is going to the word of God. And, and he speaks about prophecies that were, that were uh, in Scripture, that are in Scripture, relating to Judas. And he mentions Psalm 69, uh, and he mentions Psalm 109 in the quotations that are down a little further. And we have a real understanding or awareness that Scripture speaks to the present situations in life. And, and the point I want to get at is that he went to the Word of God. It wasn't like Peter said, well, here we are in this upper room. We've all talked about the weather as long as we can. So let's think of something else to talk about now. And it wasn't like they just kind of went with whatever now, very clearly, they, they devoted themselves to prayer. And then he goes straight to the scripture for their guidance. And what is the situation? Well, because uh, there's only 11 guys now, and one of them, be, or the one missing being Judas. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, we need some help. We need some direction as to where we go from here. And he goes to the word of God that spoke about uh, Judas prophetically in the Old Testament. And um, that's, that's where they went. So you and I, as we prepare for the work of God, we need to persevere in prayer. But we also need to stay close to the word of God. And, and that's where we go for our guidance and our instruction. And that becomes pretty clear uh, that that's what Peter is doing here. So does this not make sense? We know this already, don't we? That prayer and the word of God are so essential to living the Christian life. We know that, but we're just seeing it demonstrated here. This is how they are operating. This is how they are preparing for whatever God has for them. So he talks about Judas. And he says, uh, Judas was one who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, verse 16. He became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He, instead of taking one for the team, he quit the team and joined the other team. He was numbered among us, verse 17 was allotted his share in this ministry. But all who, um, all who are amongst the group are not necessarily in the group. And Judas showed that. Verse 18, this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Pretty, pretty gruesome detail there. Um, in, in my preaching ministry, I don't usually talk a lot about this passage. Um, I'm not sure why. But Judas is, uh, is a pretty key figure. Uh, it seems like Judas even came up, uh, didn't he, in, in what we heard from Dr. Jeremiah in Sunday school there. Come with me to Matthew chapter 26 for just a moment. Matthew chapter 26. And we just uh, notice a couple of things here about Judas. And we could, uh, there, there are many other places we could go. I just want to catch a couple of passages here. In chapter 26, uh, picking it up at verse 14. Then one of the 12, so he's numbered as one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Uh, interesting language that is used there. Then still in chapter 26, come to verse 47. <clears throat> verse 47. 
While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given him a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Stopping there. Again, he's listed as one of the 12, but he's listed as a, a betrayer. Just over in chapter 27, <clears throat> chapter 27 and verse 3 of Matthew. Then when Judas, his betrayer, see that again, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said it's not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. And it goes on there, but we'll stop. Okay, so we see a little bit about Judas. Very interesting, uh, <clears throat> he, he betrays the Lord and then he realizes he's made a mistake. He tries to go back on that to some degree, he can't. And um, uh, we do not see, do, do not mistake this, this is not him turning to the Lord. This is simply regret over his actions. There is no faith in Jesus that is being expressed here. And we see Judas then, he goes and he hangs himself. And some have sought, uh, some have said there's a contradiction between the two um, uh, descriptions. We, we have him speaking of, of being hanged here in Matthew. And then in Acts, we have this uh, more gruesome, uh, act, spoken of more gruesomely, I should say, as uh, everything, the insides kind of gush out. Well, um, both are accurate. Both are accurate, um, and it is not one or the other, it truly is both, and that is the way God's Word works as we recognize it's giving one perspective here and another perspective of the same event in a, in a different account, same thing that happens in the Gospels, by the way. But what do we learn about Judas? We could talk about him. Uh, quite extensively, but he is one who betrayed the Lord. And so it is important for us to not only be aware that we need to be in fervent prayer and uh, very close to the Word of God, but we need to be aware that there are those who will oppose our ministry. There are those who will not go along with a stand that we have taken on God's word for the cause of Christ. Judas is an example of those who spent a lot of time with Jesus, but did not place their faith in him. And we simply want to acknowledge that there, there are those who oppose. And as you prepare to serve the Lord, as you prepare for the work that God has given you to do, just be reminded that there are times that you will be opposed for your stand on God's word and God's truth. And Judas, what we know about him is that he was a betrayer. One who appeared to be in the company but was not. One who went along with things for a certain time and then openly opposed. How careful we must be to 
stay close to the truth of God so that we know what he calls us to and we do not become deceived by those who oppose or try and lead us in a different direction. Uh, we again referenced false teaching in Sunday school and so that certainly applies there. Very quickly then, uh, lastly in, in our Acts passage, verses 21 through 26 then talk about the process that they went through to select another individual. And so it was important to them that uh, they were fulfilling, uh, that scripture be fulfilled. And so they needed to be in obedience and in line with the word of God, which prophesied that another would take his office. And uh, that Judas Though he was gone, someone else would fill that spot. And so uh, it, it was uh, very important to them. There were certain qualifications that uh, the, these individuals had to have. This one that they were looking for had to be someone who had been with them throughout the ministry of Jesus. As, as it says in 21, uh, one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. And so it speaks there about that, that time period geographically, where, um, not, not chronologically, where they were together in and they were uh, spending time, years of their lives together, very significant. One who was observing Jesus, one who was in on some of those great discussions that were had. The second qualification was someone who was a witness to the resurrection. That's significant because that would be one of the things that they would be tested on or opposed about, and even to this day. And so those two qualifications, and it is significant, they didn't just open the job up for anyone who, who felt the call, so to speak. There were some very specific things uh, that needed to be met. Two individuals that, were, uh, that had met those qualifications, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. So those two individuals, and uh, they, in, in that particular time period, uh, they used this casting lots idea. Um, and in my research, it would seem that uh, that was something that took place uh, before the, the Holy Spirit's coming. And uh, that wasn't such a common thing after that uh, from the research that I had done. And so they have them uh, submitting their, their wills to the Lord and allowing him to lead them in this. And Matthias was the one. He was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now it's very significant that God is laying this out here for us because it is a reminder that there will be those who join the team. Yes, there are those who oppose but there are those who willingly place themselves as a part of the larger group and gathering. And it is an encouraging thing when individuals join the team. What are we talking about? Yes, followers in Jesus, that is a tremendous thing when they join that team. But then also this is a very specific grouping who will become leaders in the movement that happens in the rest of the book of Acts. And these individuals will be in ones who will give their lives for the sake of the gospel. And um, they, they will be involved in a lot of things. They were willing to join that team. So you and I should pray and stay close to the word of God and be aware that there will be those who will oppose but there will be others who will join the team as we prepare for whatever it is that God has for us in the days ahead. They then, uh, as we move into chapter 2, 
the Holy Spirit comes and it, it, it shakes the whole uh, group of believers and it moves in a totally different direction or a, or a forward direction from where they are presently at. They might later wish that they could have stayed huddled in the upper room because it became difficult at times and yet the gospel was clearly advancing. So you and I, as we close, are privileged to be a part of what God is doing, and we have a responsibility to be prepared for that. So what is it that is the next step for you and for me? May we seek the Lord, clearly stay close to his word and in prayer, allowing him to lead us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we continue to grow in our walk with you, May we be encouraged today that there were those um, apostles that were still, in a sense, figuring things out themselves, but yet were clearly being led by you. And I pray that we would be led by you. And that as we serve within our church, as we serve within various ministries, as we seek to be faithful in taking the gospel with us to those who need to hear, Lord, may we do so being prepared with the things that you have called us to. In Jesus' name, amen.